Hey everybody, welcome to this issue of Staffing Monthly where I am really, really thrilled to be having this conversation. It is not a demo, it's not an interview. This is generally a conversation with somebody that I have grown to uh, not consider someone that I respect highly in the in industry, but I consider this person uh, a friend. And when I look at what he's done in this industry, and then more importantly for the industry, uh, I'd be remiss if I did not bring him back to Staffing Monthly and share uh, a small celebration in his recent move, which we'll get to that in a second. But one of the reasons that I have so much admiration for this gentleman is because it was his adamant requirement that I could not have a conversation with him for Staffing Monthly unless we were guaranteed to offer something of value to you, uh, the, the person watching or listening to this event. And that's just, I think that speaks volumes about his character and really what his focus is on giving back. So it is really my distinct pleasure to have you back, John, and just chat with you about the industry and just talk shop. And I'm sure there'll be many nuggets, but I've got some questions for value in just a second. So welcome back, my friend. Dan Mori, what an introduction. Uh, you you did hit the nail on the head. Um, I think so. this will be a good episode, but uh, I, I did kind of press you on what's the so what for the field. Um, the, the last episode of Staffing uh, Monthly where we did how to sell staffing services with Coop was great. It was, it was really well received in the sense that um, we got so many nice compliments from um, just people out there that for some reason saw value in something I said, and they would send these notes of, you know, hey, uh, lest you think I'm a bad salesperson, I've closed Amazon, Nike, whatever, uh, but I've closed nothing all year. And and that was uh, that was me for most of last year. You know, doubts creeping into your heart and all these things. And, uh, and, and this one particular person was like, I, I really got something out of this episode. And just that little nudge is the only reason I agreed to keep doing these things because, again, uh, heavy dose of imposter syndrome. Uh, but apparently, you know, some of these things are valuable. So you, you drug me back to the table. They are, man. And I, I think that uh, I, I saw all that random feedback as well. It just kept popping in. It's actually That's the cool. most watched video on the channel, the most comments. So a oh, no uh, lot of requests for the slides. So you you offered a lot of value. And I think I think going back to kind of your character and integrity is you, you delivered that talk agnostically. You know, you you basically called on your six years of high performing sales in the industry for companies like Ronstadt and Adeco to um, to really show how to sell staffing services. And you didn't make it about you. You didn't make it about, you know, uh, Aviance, who you were with at the time that you presented that. You really made it about the person watching, and I think that's why it resonated. I think that's why you connected because you gave real, real valuable content. So, um, well, thank you. And 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 just a note there: um, make no mistake. I mean, thanks for the character and integrity nods, you know. But when you do something for somebody else, it's a great way to make yourself feel better at the end of the day. And doing those things, putting yourself out there, even though you know you're you're petrified to do it, um, is a great way to generate you know additional. Um, I guess, you know, interest and just goodwill towards the organization you're with. Uh, so there's a little bit strategic there in the first place. But yeah, we, we were just like, and again, huge props to Erica Kubitschek. What, what can we give folks that are here and not with their team that they can go back with? Um, so I still don't know what your uh, your so what is for the field on this one, but we're, I'm going to try and slip some in regardless we're, of your We're going to get to that next. But before I do, man, I really, I want to publicly say congratulations. You. Oh, thanks. You've had a you've had a tremendous career, and for anyone that, that doesn't know John or hasn't followed him as closely, uh, I don't know how anyone has not seen the LinkedIn post with all the, the love fest that it was. But you've had a storied career already. I mean, you were successful selling at the highest levels, developing markets for some of the biggest staffing companies out there, and then you went to Aviante and were the senior enterprise account executive over there for five years and really helped them build that piece of their business out. And we're along the journey as they were building their end to end platform and in a very pioneer way. And I can't imagine this decision was easy, but in a very pioneering way, now you've moved to glide talent, which yeah. I don't want to say too much. I'm going to ask you about yeah. them, but they, from what I've seen so far, the, the, the snippets that you've kind of opened my eyes to, 
Thank you for it's that. It's a really that. impressive software. And for those listening, that's not a paid advertisement. They are not a sponsor of the show. They, I, I, they're not a partner of any association I'm with. I've actually got to experience the the platform, and it's really cool. Uh, so, and so you moved down there. So I just want to say congratulations, man. That's a big deal, um, and I'm I'm happy for you to to move into this role. Th thank you. Yeah, the, um, the it was it was a really nice to start a new role. And have a this you know which love fest you know over the the change in career and huge shout out to Aviante. I mean, you know you don't have to work at an organization your entire life to be part of each other's mutual success. Um, and five years is a great run and it was it was fantastic. Um, but yeah, I think uh, Rod, one of our founders, uh, Rod Smith, when 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 I made that update, he's like, Are, "Do you see what's going on over on the LinkedIn post?" And I was like, "Yeah, my, my dad, my dad just called me." <laughs> Um, so that was a, so that was a good day. Uh, but again, I had no idea to have, you know, these people support and whatever, and, um, just looking to, you know, earn the support of as many out there as, you know, as warranted. So it's really, but it was a great, nice, um, first start anyway, to, to joining a new organization that is, yeah, I mean, to your point, um, about the, the career journey, I, I've always kind of, I mean, this goes back to enterprise rent a car days. Like when I was 22, I, you know, it was my first P and L I was managing, um, and always managed folks until you know got to Aviante, and every state, branch, region, territory, you know, always had a lot of upside uh, when I was first brought in. I mean, I had folks being like, you know, don't take that promotion; that place is cursed, whatever. And uh, you know, low NPS scores, colleagues, candidates, clients losing money, uh, you know, and um, and yeah, we were always we were always pretty much able to kind of like spin it up the you know top of the matrix and making money and growing and and we were had the most fun doing it we were and we were the most kind of ethical and, and honest and empathetic corner of the playground so um and Aviante, you know so i either i feel like i've either bought my stock low in, in past experiences of of uh of management or just through sheer force of will uh like the you know like the enterprise division there just kind of willed it into existence um and this actually came up in in several of the you know, hours long uh, video chats I had with Rod during this process for Glide, uh, where he was like, John, you know, have you ever worked, you know, a little bit more, you know, more towards the tip of the spear, like the, the unicorn stuff? And I was like, no, Rod, I, I, you know, you know, I absolutely have on the product side, but uh, typically no. And I've, and I've been really successful working for absolute terrorists for half the time, the, you know, again, not, not, not towards my, uh, towards Aviante, but yeah. He, and so he was like, this is going to be, uh, a great ride. Um, he, you know, it, it was just, it was a really different experience when you, um, you know, Rod reached out to me and, uh, you know, he heard a nod from, from another founder, you know, Hey, runs on the market. You know, I think this might be your guy. And, um, and I told him really, I was like, Rod, the only, the only thing you had going against you this whole time is that you were literally the first call, uh, you know, when, when people found out. So, um, that was a really long journey of, um, you know, interviewing and I, and I feel like I've worked at Glide for like two months because when you're going to the AI space and you have this, you know, tiny brain, like I do, you kind of level up really quick. Um, <laughs> so I was, I was trying to consume like, no joke, like a hundred pages a day of content. Um, again, a month or more before there was anything like offer on the table, you know, reading three different books that Rod's already read, consuming multiple podcasts a day, just so I can like be in the room. Um, and and there was and again plenty of imposter syndrome here. So when we were, I, you know, there were there were times I was like, Rod, are you are you sure this is like you could have everybody knows you loves you, you know, you could have anybody. Um, but I think things like you know how we talked about our approach approach towards success, um, working with something that's truly new, like you said, that brings true like um, pain solve and innovation to the field is just really cool and fun. It's just, it's just a very different experience. I was telling you, you know, I, watching the two founders at a table of dev guys just going until like 3 a.m. last night. And, you know, I can't hang up because I've got a million things to do. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hanging in there right with them. And it's like, it's just a different level of intensity at the, at the startup uh, space, obviously. Um, I'm already, I was already t-shirts, you know, for next week. Like that's, that's like where we're, we were at. Uh, as make, far sure as we, make sure that I get one. Cause like I'm a, I'm a t-shirt oh, guy. I, I, oh, I yeah. love that. So, so a well, lot of great nuggets in there. I'll give it a shirt back. on my back if it comes to that. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to those because there's a couple things in there. I'm going to ask questions that'll actually be part of the, so what, 
But here's how we're going to weave the so what for the audience, the value of the audience. Please tell them today. what we owe them. We're, we're going to do it chronologically. Okay. So I'm going to ask you two questions about each of your stops. And I want you to answer based on the value that you want to give to our audience. And for those watching, just so you're aware, does anybody have any of what you just said? First John of has all? no idea what I'm about to ask. Exactly. But, That's yeah. And, and nor so do this I. This is going to be completely right authentic and genuine. So you know that it's not a prepackaged answer. And okay. the reason I feel comfortable and safe doing that is because John's a good dude and he's a wealth of knowledge. So that's not why. It's because you you can throw me to the wolves and I'll and I'll do okay. You know, I'll get off the you know the, the podium or whatever and you're like, oh great job. I'm like, I have no idea what I just said. I blacked out the entire time. My hands are sweating. Like well, the good the good news is this is recorded and it will be on the internet forever. So oh, fantastic. Great. Know. That's a so, tea. Here we go. So here's here's my my first stop. So go we go way back when to when you were selling staffing services. Yep. You said it had upside potential. So pretend you're talking to a salesperson, just someone out there carrying a bag, and they're just trying to get their client. They're trying to make their quota for a month or the year or whatever it is. They're just trying to actually go break into doors in a tough selling environment. So what? Yeah, what yeah. is the value? What is your go-to technique, tool? What is it that you're actually telling that salesperson to do to be successful? Yeah, um, I think I've got two for this. Um, you know, when I, I always joke, I built my staffing experience pyramid upside down. I started with the most difficult, longest sales cycle um, with the on-site model. Excuse me. And I made a deal with my SVP. I was like, hey, you have three of these on-sites now. When I sell three more, you know, I, I, I want to manage them all. He's like, yeah, fine. And um, I thought I knew what sales was coming out of Enterprise Rent-A-Car until you, you know, get to a Dutch company like, uh, no, 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 this is Salesforce. Uh, you're going to log 10 connects a day. You're going to do two presentations a month. You're going to close two million a quarter or you're out. And I had this big chunk of time at Enterprise. I was like, well, I don't want to have a wonky looking resume. I got to like make this happen. Again, my approach was the same thing. Grinding on 100 pages a day of internet articles, thought leadership pieces, whatever, so I could talk staffing if I actually got a C-suite decision maker on the line. And um, and I was scared to put myself out there. And I had this epiphany one day. I wonder if I still have this from the wind, um, where I was like, you know what? Your competition isn't waiting to call on anybody. Like, you better just get on it. And I I did a lot of, like, standard, you know, voicemail outreach stuff. But I customized it and to the point where um, I would honestly say like things like, you know, based on what I've seen from your um, your website and your guiding principles and the type of business you do, we, we're considering adding an additional onsite and we think you might be a good fit. And I was relentless with follow-up. Um, and there was a company called Leatherman Tools and I left a bunch of messages and, and just kept writing it. And finally this, and I found the story out later, the VP was like, to the director of HR, could you call this guy back? He keeps saying we're going to be a good fit for him. And so she did. She's like, hey, we're actually in RFP mode right now. We already down selected from eight to four. Like you'd have to be out here tomorrow, you know, and obviously, you know, one or on the phone to even get this chance uh, to do a site safety evaluation and then like be ready to present next week. And so we we, we jumped on it. We did that. And um, and my boss at the time was like, just thought that was the corniest thing that I was saying. You know, we think he might be a good fit for us. And here's the reasons. Um and then when we got to the boardroom presentation moment, when it's, you know, six of them down one side, the big table, you know, six of my team, and I'm, I'm standing up at the front. Um, I was introduced by that VP being like, yeah, you know, this is John, from, you know, from Ronstadt, you know, from, they think that, you know, we might be a good match for their type of business, you know, and she literally relayed back to me my, my, uh, my pitch, and I just looked over at my SVP, and she's just shaking her head. So you gave um, her the talk track. You gave her the talk yeah, track. Yeah, it was it was it was really kind of like a relentless pursuit to not fail, um, honestly, and uh, and then just the courage to put myself out there like this when I don't want to, and uh, and yeah, that was our first big win. And they they actually have a laser engraved John written on this thing, but um, that was a fantastic win, and it just taught me a ton. And so I guess it's kind of a persistence thing. And going back to to tie this into the last episode, you know. The sales game has changed so much, even in the last like nine months. Like we're getting killed out there. Um, I've had, I've talked to people who are just off to a rough start this year. I've talked to people that are you know looking for work. Um, you know it's really hard to find good salespeople because if they're if they're good, they're in their role and they're crushing, or they're three years in and they've you know been in their patch of dirt and there's those longer established relationships are starting to come to fruition. Um, but yeah, I just I think those tried and true things like. 
um, persistence and how you present yourself, whether and having the same type of call to action in your email or your voicemail or whatever, I don't know that that's ever going to change. But I think the people are sick of the automated stuff, the repetitive stuff, like every single thing you do kind of has to be personalized. Um, so that would be my, that would be my main one. And I think I touched on a couple, but does that, does yeah. that count? Yeah, no, that, that is, that is great. And really now I want to speak specifically to where you've kind of lived in your entire career and it's sort of enterprise sales. So the, the staffing industry is huge. There's 20,000 plus uh, staffing yeah. agencies in North America. So it's a very fragmented industry and we sell into small business, we sell into the mid market and we sell into enterprise. But it, selling an enterprise is a completely different buyer. It's a more sophisticated process. It's a whole different animal. So what, what does somebody do differently? I guess, what does the enterprise selling model look like that's different to make it more successful actually going out and acquiring a huge company, you know, something that's truly an enterprise company. How do you do that? How do you sell that differently? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, and there's a couple of big things that jump out and, and, and keep in mind when I, um, uh, left the enterprise, um, RVP, you know, kind of, um, management and sales, uh, bag, um, I started Aviante mid market, small, medium, again, thinking that I knew everything about staffing, I've been an RVP for you know however long, and and I have I had thirty sub vendors, so I know these you know small medium, and then you get to Aviante, you're like sixty percent of the industry is you know twenty colleagues and under or roughly yeah. whatever the number is, I know nothing, um, and I'm also you know learning SaaS, and I'm swinging at these you know two user deals, ten user deals, you know whatever, um, so we definitely pushed you know there, it wasn't just a plop into the enterprise space. Um, you know, through the support of leadership there, we kind of, again, willed it into existence and pushed ourselves upstream. We had tons of large enterprise clients at Aviante. It was just um, never a huge focus for like new biz dev. And I think, um, I think the transition that people don't realize right out of the gate is in enterprise sales, it's not about you at all. It is literally your ability to bring in as many other voices and um, just different cadences of, of, of speaking, different expertise, different genders, ages, you know, um, whatever those things are, you, you have to move out of the um, driver's seat as quickly as you can. And it'd be more of the, um, like the ringleader of this, you know, huge circus where you're pairing up yourself with the tractors or putting your colleagues on them. And they have an established relationship because they've been brought into the calls early and positioned as a subject matter expert, either on an executive alignment call or tech alignment call. Just, I think that don't, people don't realize at the enterprise level, how much it really, the more you can make it less about you, um, the earlier, um, the, the better you're served. Um, because, and then just, you know, fast forwarding to the, the reality of, of enterprise space, you know, what, what's my joke about, um, RFPs. If you weren't if you weren't there nine months ago, uh, oh, RFPs are like babies. If you weren't there nine months ago, it's not yours. Meaning every oh, single oh like <laughs> meaning every that's, single that's, RFP. That's a RFP, sound bite right there. Yeah, I'm sure that's going to get a lot of a lot of clicks. Um, meaning that you have to have been there, and 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 it, and it's it seems odd. I mean, I can, I can remember tons of times where you know we would have conversations. Wait, why are they? Why are these guys going out to RFP? Like, is this just a is this a song and dance? Is this a pricing exercise? We already have a relationship with them, even sometimes in cases. Um, but yeah, you have to be in there with them. Um, and so I just think that that, you know, the reality of responding to RFPs all day in a typical standard enterprise role where you have no, um, you know, access to power or influencers or contract signers, or um, you don't have access to people that are close to the pain and you don't know all of that you're in a pretty tough spot. Like you're just, you might as well just throw out some low numbers so that you, at least, you know, your competition has to respond with something equally as, you know, uh, you know, neg negligible on the, on the pricing side, because it's really, really tough to just respond to RFPs. I would not want that job. So yeah, I would say, you know, the more you can get out of that um, standard flow just by being um, engaging and trustworthy and, being able to look people in the eye and say, like, give me your business. I'll do a really good job with it, I promise. Um, and they feel it. And then sticking around after contract sign through post-sale, at least through implementation and go live and whatever, um, as long as you're additive, and I think there's a, a, a role there for any enterprise salesperson post-contract sign, that post-sale work is is huge. Because we've all been victim of the, oh, yeah, I think it's going to be great, sign on the line, and then you know the salesperson disappears. Yeah. Uh, and I think I just carried that a lot of that, 
type of um, that type of style with me from from being a selling RVP. I knew that I was going to have to service whatever I closed, so I was very easy. It was very easy to say that. And then you know, as I moved out of that position, as a true, I hadn't I hadn't been an individual sales producer until I got to Aviat. It was twenty years. I never. I mean, I knew how much we were put upon as salespeople. But when you when you get in, into the individual producer role again, and you're just you know a rep, as some people think of you, um, it is rough. And uh, and so you have to as quickly as possible position yourself as a trusted business advisor. Um, you know the stuff about um, you know we're, we're we're huge partners with Bullhorn. I was a fierce competitor of Bullhorn forever, but I never I always I always positioned. Uh, and again, I'm I'm a masshole. I learned to speak the King's English in Boston, so I, I get <laughs> the. Um, as, as a child, I lived there. But anyway, um, you have to like, I, I whenever that came up, I would always say, you know, like, what does your competition do best? The worst thing I would say is like, well, they devalue my product. Typically, that wasn't a bullhorn statement, but that was always my line is that my competition, you know, lowers my stock. But in the case of bullhorn, I always said, you know, uh, there's enough great things about us. I don't want to say anything negative about our competition. Um, I was a bullhorn user. If you ask me about my experience, you know, happy to elaborate, you know, but um, that's really not why we're here. And uh and I, I'm glad that that was always my mantra because you can be a fierce competitor and still have somewhat of a soul if you yeah. you know if you take that tack. If you get into negative selling, you're, it's either through ne- immaturity or um, you know just fear and, fear, and yeah, scarcity, I, scarcity mindset. You know, yeah. I, I was talking to a CTO I really respect um, uh, uh, this guy Robert Law Bob over at Sedona Group, and um, and he was talking about um, negative selling, and he was like. Yeah, I know. I, I I said, you know, I can't believe people do that. He goes, oh, I don't mind negative selling. And this guy's a real, you know, ethical, strong, you know, uh, person. I was like, that, that caught me off guard. I go, what do you mean, Bob? You don't like, you don't mind negative selling. He goes, I don't mind it because if it's true, then I'm glad, you know, I got a little bit of the heads up, but I always fact check it. And if they're wrong, they're dead to me forever. And I was like, well, I'm not willing to, to why take that risk? What if, you know, that negative sell, yeah. selling point, they've evolved their product roadmap since then or whatever. There's just, there, there's, there's enough great things about us. You don't have to say anything negative about the competition to, uh, to crush it. Yeah. That's kind of- no, I, I, I agree with that. Um, so I do want to ask one question about your yeah. time when you were at Aviante, yeah, please. you, and not necessarily about software, I'm not trying to turn this into a commercial about them, but you obviously were in touch with a lot of different staffing companies, right? Because that was your customer when you were in Aviante and you probably dealt with all different levels of staffing agencies. You've talked to a bunch of staffing agencies. So right now, I want you to basically reach back into your your memory bank and I want you to pull out, what is the coolest thing that you've seen any staffing agency actually doing that differentiates them in the market? And when you looked at that, you're like, wow, that is unique. And that that was really cool. Okay, I got one for you. That was quick. Uh, Greg Lambert, uh, Terra Staffing. Um, okay, he's right down the block. He, yeah, he's great. Um, don't, don't. Sorry, Greg, but you know, th- I think he was a hacker in high school. Like the feds might might have been knocking on his door. When <laughs> he's that good. Uh, no, his name just, may or may not be Greg. Got it. Right, right. Yeah, Ryan's a schmeg. And so, um, it, Greg was my first, um, you know, my very first COVID in person call. And he's got his own, you know, custom tech stack. Um, he's been acquiring other firms. He, he's 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 off to the races. But yeah, he's he, he develops his own time clocks, his AI thing. I mean, he's got his own custom platform. So the call was basically this is early COVID, three months in. Like we, and I, and I was like, I'm desperate to see another person. I know you're down the block. Are you comfortable? If you are, I am too. And so I, we, and he's like, yes, get down here. So we went. I went down. We lifted up the hood on both of our platforms, you know, uh, and just compared notes and just walked through it. And he has a really interesting model where, and he called me out so good on it once on a big group call. Um, if you think about how you got your last job or I got my last job, we didn't apply, you know, we didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't turn in a resume. And so he's built his entire platform around that model. And there's other unique things like he pays his branch managers, like area managers, areas like VPs. He's got tons of, um, of colleague tenure, but he's got a ton of uh, contract labor tenure because he takes that almost like perm model right. where everything starts with a conversation um, versus submitting a resume. Like that thing, the resume has got to die a natural death here pretty soon, I hope. Um, and he treats everybody like that, but he's built his, his, his 
you know, you think of this typical funnel that exists in most ATSs, like the pipeline structure, it's just very different the way he does it. Um, and it works. And it's unique, and um, and and so so is he, and so is um, the, you know the rest of his, his style, and so I, I greatly respected, and um, and yeah, he's an Aviante client now, and and uh, all the things, but yeah, that 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 is one that stands out to me because um, it took me five years to wear him down. He wears his you know cards really close to his chest, but when you get on the other side, it's he's a great friend and, and somebody really worth uh, listening to. He's in a lot of CEO roundtables and things, and that that bravery to to. Think of something yourself that's different and then build, you know, your entire business model and platform around it. You know, that's, that's, um, that's respectable. And that, that true is the true definition of unique value, right? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't get any more unique than, than doing that piece right there. So now I want to move into the new role, right? So, sure. and the, the question here is you made a move to go from a company that was, was pushing the boundaries of staffing tech with platform staffing, right? Yep. They're, they're sort of they're sort of going from the evolution of the ATS to the tech stack, and now they're building out and and platform staffing, which is really it's kind of cutting edge, right? So yep. now you've moved into the even further into the cutting edge with AI, <laughs> which it seems like it I seems know. like no one even thought about AI until Chat GPT went mainstream like a year and a half ago, right? And everyone now everyone yep. is like rushing to bring something AI to market. So the two questions I have, well, the first question I have is, what are you seeing? You said that you actually, uh, and this can be a multi-part question, you can answer it in a couple of different ways, but you said that you had to get brushed up on AI. So what did you learn about AI? What are the podcasts you listened to? What, what information did you do to dig into it? And what did you learn from that, that the staffing industry needs to know about AI and how it's going to impact them? Yeah, I think there's a there's a good story that, that um, reflects a lot of this, um, specifically around what the staffing industry thinks today, and this goes back to one of the early conversations I had with Rod, um, where you know there's this perception that nobody wants to talk to a bot, right? Like you've heard that, yeah. Uh, and and Rod was kind of you know walking me through this, and and if you think about it, and this is this reflects that this is the data that we you know pulled out of Glide, um, two really good measures of a relationship are the length of time you spend talking to somebody and the depth of topic that you get into, like you and me right now, like we, we, we talk for a long time, we, we get into the stuff. Um, and when you look at Glide, you know, Rod, this is Rod telling me, he's like, you know, the, cause he wanted to validate that nobody wants to talk, talk to a chatbot comment that, that's floating around out there. If you look at the comments um, and the length and depth of the conversations that are happening with AI, they were um, more depth and deeper than the conversations that were happening at the recruiter level. And so that's like the anthropological side, right? But if you, so this is Rod's leading up to like his punchline, which is, yeah. And then if you look at the NPS scores of Glide versus the recruiters, Glide performs significantly better on the candidate side uh, in the interactions than, than the recruiters did. And, you know, I'm smiling this whole time, and he, and he, but not for the reason that he thinks. And I was like, and he goes, and he, and he actually capped off with, John, I bet if in a year from now, if you were given the choice to push a button between talk to an AI or your average branch recruiter, like you and I are going to probably push AI now just because we're, you know, early adopters, whatever. Um, and, and he was saying this, and I said, Rod, let me, let me tell you something. <laughs> when, six years ago, when I was at a deco, we had a chat bot called Maya. And this thing was clutch for all the you know blocking and tackling reasons um, that the glide would be as far as like after hours stuff and whatever. And it literally said on the screen, I am not a person. And once a week at least, somebody would come into the branch and, and ask for Maya. And like once a quarter, some guy would come in at, look, trying to ask Maya out on a date. And then when the and then when we got our NPS scores of, of the chatbot versus um versus the recruiters the NPS scores were higher too. And it was a big deal. I remember being like, oh God, did I fail them? Like, this is so sad. Like, do we, how do we distribute this information if at all? Um, and this is pre COVID. This is, this is from the tech back then. Um, and so I said, Rod, it's not going to take a year. It's already here. Um, so I think that kind of thing where, uh, as far as answering the specific question of um, what does the staffing industry need to know? Um, and again, I need to reorient every glide, you know, back up to the top of the funnel. We're talking about, um, can I, you know, the, can I, so I don't, yeah. I don't want to derail the train there, but can, oh, I, yeah. can I jump in and share a couple thoughts on that? 
Yeah, please. No, I want, I want your take because I know you're going to beat me up about it. So go ahead. So, <laughs> I'm not going to beat you up about it, man. So here's here's my take. I, I think I think Rod is astute by saying, hey, in a year from now. But I also think it's going to be generational. Right. So if you were to ask somebody that was, you know, maybe a boomer that question, they might still say, you know, I want to talk to a real person, right? You get Gen For X. Sure. It We're might talking be... aggregate. And again, right. that's so, not why it is, is push a button, this or that. So yeah, no, I get it. But what I'm saying is okay. if you were to do that, you're going to see it generational. But I think that the important thing to recognize is that the further we go in the future, the more of the younger generation that are going to be more likely to say, yeah, just let me talk to a bot. So I, I feel like getting on board with it now might might benefit that. And I also got to say, and again, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about what you kind of let me take a look at. Wait, okay. But... Tread lightly. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, so, so I'm just going to speak generally then. So engaging with a bot is quick, right? It's quick. So if I'm, if I'm asking about a job and I'm in that moment, like I want to know about that job and in the, in just human beings, like your word, anthropologically speaking, right? Like people are distracted, every single day, like the easiest thing to do in the world is to get distracted, right? And like, it's it's crazy. But if I'm interested in a job right now, like I'm interested in that moment of time. And if the recruiter, if a real human, which I'm on record, I don't think AI will ever replace. No, 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 no. This uh, is again, this is so, we already need a top of the funnel apply. Right. And, and, and oh, you're gonna love but, this. But, yeah. So my, my point is, though, that if that recruiter is not sitting in front of the the chat, bot on their end, or they're not able to SMS and message back and forth or email right away, and any amount of time passes, or if I can't see the bubbles, like that person on the other end is typing because our phones have conditioned us, like <laughs> I'm gonna leave and go get distracted. So I honestly think that one of the reasons that the NPS score is higher on a bot is because they're more responsive and quicker. Like they actually respond quicker with the details that a job seeker is gonna be looking for and they meet they meet them in the moment. And I'm willing to bet that that has something to do with it. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, it, that's it, that's my take on it. In a small part, because here's the thing: there's multiple channels of buy. I mean, it, it manages the job dis distribution and the spend. But to your point about like the busy, you know, you can cap it at you know this many screens. You know, have come in. A recruiter can only handle the hiring manager that they're sending these people to can only handle so many folks like do you want to stop at 10 screened do you want to stop at um or just keep going until you get 10 screened whatever that whatever that is but what you're not considering is like what it also does think about it. also nps we bring in so many people into the ats that never work for us oh it's all additionally yeah and then we send them surveys how was how did we help you well you didn't help me at all the great that's going to help my, my nps score yeah right Additionally, what Glide does, and again, everybody gets a response within an hour. So it redirects people who the recruiter, through no fault of their own, um, would 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 maybe try and put on that role. What Glide actually does, and could think about how many, I don't know about you, but 60% of my attempts were like one and done. And I yeah. think it has a lot to do with it. Yeah, one, one, one job, and they never come back. And so this will actually redirect them to the positions that they will actually succeed at it and 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 give the feedback in a way that keeps them engaged and and it, it doesn't pound them forever but it, it does the follow-up text email um with this kind of redirection so you actually get people into the first role that will stay there longer you've increased the time to fill because it's running 24 7 no human touch um and then you think about the redeployment piece because that first experience was something that was actually a match like it's I have yet to show it to somebody that what wasn't. I mean, I'm slammed. It's 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 really really cool. Um, and again, it's almost like telling you think about it. Of course, AI is never going to replace the recruiter, but think about all those offshore Philippine models or, or you know in the Philippines or, or RPO models. Like again, we're just talking about top of the funnel screening, meaningful interactions, and in, in they're interacting with you in a way that they know you like tropical islands and you know whatever you're you you, you know you want to vote for biden there's literally the ai is interacting with you in a way that's meaningful and that's what leads to those longer conversations and that loyalty redirects them does the follow-up um it's it's almost like telling again the recruiter will always be there but it's almost like telling nurses like you're never gonna have to make a bed again all you have to do is focus on patient care and so they would that's love that. what's that they would love that they would love that and so that's that's the piece where um 
you know, and again, even back to the job board thing, like how often did you get a big glut of folks from Indeed and be like, Indeed is our go-to. And at best, you you would look back on the numbers for the month and say, you know, where, where people came from and whatever. Uh, but this is doing it live in the moment and directing the spend towards quantity and quality and throughput, as well as engaging with them and doing the follow-up and screen. Like it's, it's pretty yeah. incredible. Um, it, I'm very lucky to be here. And it, um, it's worth seeing. It's just, I, I, you know, I'm genuinely excited it, about it. It is. And, and and I'll get to that kind of our closing question in a second, oh. but I, I, as another observation, just thinking about unique value proposition and a salesperson out there and having to differentiate yourself. I think it would be really cool having an AI tool just like that to if you're sitting in front of a prospect and they're like, why should I choose you? Like I have every staffing agency in the city knocking on my door three times a day. Like, why should I choose? Why is your fishing pool you? any different? Why aren't you a commodity? Yeah, you know, it's exactly. Like right. So it's like, like, I tell you what, let's just show it. And if you're a savvy salesperson and you literally preload into your app, like the job that you might be getting from this prospective client. And you're like, hey, let's pull this up right now. Pull our website up, pull our app up, whatever, and just apply to that job and let's see what happens. And if they see that interaction that quickly, that seamlessly, that responsive, and you're like, we do that 24 seven. And we're not oh. only looking at our massive database of talent and sorting it through with all these other really cool tools, but we're also pulling off job boards. So like the, we have the ability to cover every candidate at the top of the funnel and basically effectively triage them down so that when our recruiters, they, they focus all of their time on quality control and vetting. Would it make sense that if our recruiters have all of their time to focus on quality control and vetting, that they're more likely to send you a better candidate that's gonna work better for you and produce better for you? That makes sense. That's why you should this choose- This is why business. we were friends. I literally, when I was selling staffing services, I made an animated GIF, which was six years ago, it was you know an Olympic feat. Um, of Maya talking to a guy who was applying for a forklift position and he was, and he like interrupted her and said like, he's a smoker or something. And the way she handled it and literally that, and my after hours voicemail tool, like Harkin, so I could screen people after hours for like a phone interview for call center positions. Those were my, my two differentiating tech pieces, but that, that chat, the, the, the interactive gif of them talking to somebody. It, people wouldn't look back at me during the presentation. They just kept staring at the screen with this thing talking to me. And, and, and my, sp my take on it, not even spin was, you know, whether you're a global staffing firm or, you know, uh, mom and pop, even or mid segment, um, you're in the best position either way. Cause you have the tech that differentiates and you have the local relationship. So you still have caring as part of your DNA, but absolutely you have to do something that's gonna um, differentiate you from the competition, whether you're going out that day to try and get a TNC signed for one order, or you're responding to an enterprise piece, those those buyers are all thinking that. So tee up the intro with, hey, I bet you're, you've are you been inundated your entire HR career with you know um, staffing salespeople. Let me just elephant in the room. How are we any different from the other people fishing out of the same set of zip codes, same folks? Um, and the way to do that is to touch on the heart piece and the tools. And, you know, so that, that, that was my take. That's it. When they say, aren't you all fishing from the same pond? No, our tools allow us to fish from the ocean. Yeah, yeah, we have the, yeah, exactly. We're that guy <laughs> like, you know, that, sitting on the jetty with that like weight, you know, I see those on YouTube and he launches it 20 feet out the air. And, you know, yeah. it. so the, the last question I have, I said, I would ask a couple at each stop and to add oh, value. Yeah. So what, and again, disclaimer, if you've watched this far in the video, uh, GlideTalent.com is not a paid advertiser. This is not promotional. And I've not even seen a full demo yet. Okay. No, uh, so I'm just crazy. hearing it from John. I'm excited about this part of the stage of John's career. So what what is Glide going to do for... We'll say it. Let's, let's pick a, an average middle market staffing agency. What is Glide going to do for them? Think about um, think about just having a stable. Okay, let me back up. If you think about it, Dan, like how crazy would it be if I told you, "Hey, I'm this massively publicly traded company, and I've based my entire success at the end of the day on our ability to change a recruiter's behavior." Like that is literally what. If you think about um, how to like affect change in a branch, you are trying to manage your your people to get the best results. You're taking the repetitive, um, inefficient, uh, time consuming, and at the end of the day, not as engaging <laughs> portion of the interaction, 
and you're doing it 24 hours a day and you're taking that off their plates and they're just getting screen candidates that are the right person for the job. You have a database that is engaged people that is not just a bunch of whatever. The follow-up is there. It's It just takes off that, again, this glide is top of the funnel. Um, if you think long-term, and this is really cool too, you know, where the product is staying, where it's going is even more exciting. Um, it out of the gate, I, again, I've yet to show somebody this and be like, wow, um, I, 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 I want to try this. You could, you implement it with an email implementation takes a day. And so I'm, I'm just like, Hey, if you, if you want to test the results, I don't do it. Imagine enterprise implementation anywhere. I mean, a deco is like, you know, it took us a year and then and then you might start getting you know paid off it which made sense you've got to generate the revenue in order to comp but it's like most of my enterprise deals took nine months a year longer um on the SaaS side and so I'm, i just say you know if, if if you're if you're unsure you can just start with it with the ai piece and the emails and the texting for the screening you know not even the job for distribution and, and management although you should and just pick out a sample just do a pilot just just run it because any staffing leader that where if something works and they're able to say like I did this and this is better and look at the the the, the change you know the, forget the soft stuff of like you know more time for rapport building activities and more revenue generating activities you can see the difference and so in yes. time to fill again redeployment uh, the quality the NPS scores like just you can just carve out you know not even a whole time zone or leadership hierarchy or whatever for a mid market person I would say. There's cost wise, it it's, makes sense to just, you know, you could even just dip your toe in the water to see what that looks like. And again, be, having people engage with it, they're like, oh, okay, this is, and then you show them the data and then you explain the aha moments of like, look, six years ago, I was using a chat bot of that tech without half of, you know, half, without 90% of the things that are in Glide. And it, back then the NPS scores were better than my recruiters, which is, again, I still see as a huge failing on my part, but yeah, I mean that's that. Those are the main kind of blocking and tackling what would get somebody interested enough to see a demo, and I've yet to show somebody one that um, wasn't you know fully engaged at, by you know by the end, well, which is very different. Imagine imagine how many calls it takes to you know or demonstrations getting you know everyone bought in in the average enterprise. I mean, I was looking back on one recent large enterprise win. There was a I had a hundred forty. Let's we can back out a couple, but I searched the name of the client in my calendar um, in Outlook. And 140 meetings popped up in the last year. Uh, it was like it was like 200 in the last four years. Wow! If somebody sees this and they, after I don't know, 45 minutes, and and they're they're not they're just not ready. If then if they if they don't um, you know see the value, that's okay. And, um, and I think I think it's going to be a shorter sales cycle because it solves a very tactical problem, right? Like at the end of the day, when you think about you know filling jobs, you have to have an enormous amount of talent coming down the pipeline. And if, and if you don't have the recruiting team bandwidth in the middle of the funnel to absorb that, you're going to get, you're just going to lose people. And those people you've paid to get there, you know? So well, if you have a tool kind of managing the top of the funnel efficiently and driving the best quality talent out of the top of the funnel to the middle, now you're actually stacking the deck in your favor. And that is a, that is a, that is a gambling reference because we're going to be in Vegas next week, but um, think, think about think about this. How, how many beast recruiters have you ever had that just crushed it that weren't always the first one in the branch? The reason that they crushed is because they were they were in, in some ways a little bit outside of normal hours. People are not necessarily looking for a job when the office is open. This thing just is just running twenty four seven. Yeah, um, and again, it's not. I, I ain't even calling it a bot, but that's just that's going to be here for a while. Um, when you look at the level of engagement through the through the app, it's um, it's pretty cool to see. Kind of speaks for itself. Well, that that's exciting. So, so last two things. Uh, I know that I've not you said that three times yet. now. By the way, this has been your last two things for like a half an hour. Well, I'm getting to them. These are my I last two things for you. So, uh, number one, count it down. Number one is I've not seen a demo yet, and you promised me. Now it's on air. It's out there. You promised me that one of the co-founders, Shane, is going to take me through it, and he, he's going to show me and the world. Uh, what Glide Talent is all about. And I do got to make well, wait, this. To put a finer point on that, you asked me to do this pod and I said, I can't, what self-promoting, you know, Harpy would put themselves on instead of when they could put their founder on. And then, you know, he obviously, you know, talked me off the edge. Um, 
Shane doesn't need to do a demo for you. You just need to talk to Shane and Rod because they're a hoot. They're both Irish and they're just a blast. So uh, we'll, I will do we're, we're going to talk to Shane soon and he's going to. Oh, yeah. But, but the, the demo is going to be at the pool somewhere. That's my. If you, I'll, I'll, well, that's I'll, my next. That's the number two thing is how how do people talk to how do they find you at SIA exec forum? And if they're not going to exec forum, how do they find you otherwise? Yep. Uh, John, J-O-N, GlideTalent.com. Glide with a Y. Um, I'll put my, maybe we could flash out my contact information after this would be, or something, but It'll um, be right I'll be there. everything is clickable down below. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll be there Sunday. Um, I've got tons of bandwidth um, for lots of conversations. Um, I, I haven't even, I'm only like 75% of my way through looking at responding to the people who, who, commented or said sent me a dm the phone just wouldn't stop ringing i couldn't get through anything the texts and all that stuff and again I don't you need know. an ai bot to manage the top of the funnel and just prioritize people for you rod said change your voicemail to uh I, i'm i'm doing this and just you know here book a meeting here somehow um but yeah and then wednesday i think we'll be um we might have a little something um you know, over by the pool, but yeah, it's all very last minute. Um, you know, I'm behind, but you know, if you're not working a million hours and again, you know, I told you we were up to like three last night and, and back on it, like, you know, eight this morning and it's so fun. It's so fun to be this kind of busy. And frankly, if you're not working a million hours before exec forum, then you're probably not in staffing because we're all procrastinators and we all wait the last minute, or you're just not setting yourself up for success by putting the extra hours leading up to an event like this. So um, yeah, I'll be around all week. Um, you'll, we'll do the click to contact thing. Um, but yeah, I love it. Thanks I so much for having me on. You, you, you ran, you know, medium speed over me. That was, that was, that was fine. So John, I, I, I'm grateful for you to be here. For those of you watching, go check out GlideTalent.com. It's actually really cool. Uh, and if you're going to exec forum this week, obviously I'll be there. So make it a point to connect with me, but go find John and go see a demo of this thing yourself. I know I'm going to go look at it firsthand because I think it's pretty sweet what they're doing. Um, and then we'll get one tell of the co-founders on. So, you know, you're a good, you're a good uh, judge of character, good judge of, uh, of product worthiness. You're, you're driving the same kind of stuff, man. I, I, I want to grow up and be you one day. So thank you for having me on. <laughs> I wouldn't wish that on anybody, man. I'm just out here doing the best I can. Same, same, right. same. Is that the truth?